Hi, this is Sean Perrin, and you're listening to episode 18 of the Clarinet Podcast. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, Daddario is redefining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with technology built from the ground up. By using the world's most innovative techniques to deliver consistently what was once made variable by hand, Daddario ensures excellence right out of the box as standard, not a surprise. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from Daddario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com slash woodwinds. Today's guest on the podcast is Ed Joffe, who's returning for part two in a three-part series. If you haven't checked out part one, be sure to head back to episode 17 and give it a listen before this one. You don't have to do that particularly because we do talk about different things in each episode, but I really think that Ed had a lot of great things to say and it would be a real shame to miss what he had to say in episode 17. The giveaway for this series of episodes is a signed copy of Ed's latest CD called Contrast. This project was meant to sort of encapsulate and and, uh, define and almost be an autobiography of Ed's musical life, as we discussed in the previous episode. And I think it also really exemplifies the the, the feeling of being a musical chameleon, which he sort of talks about as well. What that means is basically being able to play multiple styles and uh, equally well. And it's really required for the type of work that Ed was doing on Broadway and as a doubler. Um, Here on the CD, you'll hear all sorts of different tunes ranging from jazz to contemporary classical. And the piece I played last week was a jazz tune called It's About Buddy. And today I'd like to play for you the first movement of the Bartok Bartok Contrast, which is, of course, completely different. Hope you enjoy it. This is Ed Joffe playing the Bartok Contrast on his new CD called Contrast. Let's move on and talk about your book a little bit here. It's divided into three main sections, and I'd like to briefly discuss each one. The title of the book is Woodwind Doubling for Saxophone, Clarinet, and Flute. Um, the first section is about the history of doubling, and I, I was really fascinated actually by the history of woodwind musicians from 1300 to 1900. I can't believe this, but I somehow had no idea that the orchestra of the 19th century the uh, all the parts, the flute, oboe, and shalomo, um, and bassoon were often played by the same musicians. That's so different from from today. What do you think life was like for a, a musician in, say, Mozart's orchestra back then? Right, right. It's also the 18th and 19th centuries. That was re- re- uh, commonplace for oboists, especially, to uh, play recorders and to play flutes and. In cases, in some cases, for uh, bassoonists to play flute as well, uh, that was where the doubles happened. So, uh, you know, when I began uh, writing this book and trying to put a historical section together, I thought I was just going to go back to the days of Paul Whiteman in the 1920s, who had, you know, wind sections where, you know, the three wind, the three initial wind players played numerous. Uh, instruments. And in fact, the, the famous clarinet player, Russ Gorman, who played the Rhapsody in Blue Smear on the initial recording, played something like 
12, 15, 18 instruments at every Gershwin concert. Uh, you know, it was ridiculous. So that was my idea of where the history of woodwind doubling happened. But I found out <laughs> shortly thereafter that no, uh, even going back to the time of Bach, uh, woodwind doubling, in other words, playing a lot of wind instruments, including brass instruments, was common fare. Uh, in Germany, there was a history of a type of uh, a musician called the Stadtpfeifer who was basically a town musician that would you know, go from town to town and play for various ceremonial uh, affairs. And they would be responsible for playing any type of woodwind or brass instrument. And Bach's family, his lineage, had numerous uh, relatives of his who were Stadtpfeifers. And old J.S. himself was probably destined to be a Stadtpfeifer had not he... Uh, been relocated to Leipzig and happened to be, uh, you know, a few doors down from a church with a magnificent organ. Uh, otherwise, we might not have some of the great music today. I mean, if he had stayed at, at you know, and has stayed at home and not moved to his relative's home in Leipzig, uh, who knows? Bach would have been a Stadtpfeiffer that we would never have heard of again. Yeah. Uh, but these were uh, town musicians that were popular throughout much of Europe. And it carried forward uh, into the time of Joseph Haydn. And, and so many of Haydn's early symphonies, and with uh, specific ones like number 9 and 24, have situations where the first and second movement, you have two oboes. This was during the time of his apprenticeship or his work at Esterhazy. And it was a very small orchestra. They never, never really got above 25 musicians. And so the two oboe players were very prevalent in those times. And that's, in fact, why the oboe gives the A, because, in, you know, with a group of 25 and you have two oboes, they're cutting right through mm -hmm. the orchestra. And, and so they were among the loudest instruments in being heard in the orchestra. Anyway, those two oboists that Haydn wrote for uh, also had the ability to play flute and recorders. And so in order to change up the color and to change the nature of the movements in the third movements of Symphonies 9 and 24, those two oboes suddenly disappear and suddenly you have two flutes. And back in the fourth movement, suddenly two oboes reappear. Well, <laughs> uh, Haydn didn't waste, uh, you know, two flute players sitting there not playing the first, second and fourth movements. They were the same guys. Uh, and Mozart similarly made use of oboes and flutes that way in some of his early symphonies, like 6, 9, 12... Uh, 14 and 24, if I recollect correctly, as well as numerous other instrumental uh, works. Uh, so this was not uncommon. Uh, and even bringing into the 19th century, you know, Adolf Sachs, who obviously created the saxophone and the bass clarinet, by the way, uh, was an exceptional, according to everything we've read about him, exceptional flutist and clarinetist. Mm -hmm. And so when he opted to take up the challenge of developing the saxophone, uh, he made use of his knowledge of both the single reed and uh, the flute. Uh, so the saxophone, in a sense, mimics both instruments uh, a, a little bit, uh, certainly in the fingerboard of the flute and certainly in the single reed concept of the clarinet. So, you know, the idea of multiple woodwind players is nothing new. It's it just took on a different form in 20th century America as, uh, you know, the dance bands and jazz bands evolved into the late teens after uh, World War One and the 20s. Um, and, of course, uh, Paul Whiteman's band was probably the uh, high point of that uh, mm -hmm. and emphasizing that. But it's a long history of multiple woodwind players. Now, to the point of the clarinet, and again, I'm not saying this because we're on a clarinet podcast. But the clarinet is the most difficult of the single reeds. I, I can't speak to the oboe and bassoon because I don't play them. But clarinet, flute, and saxophone family of instruments. The clarinet is by far the most difficult. Uh, one, because it's a cylindrical bore and uh, as compared to the conical bore of the saxophone and flute. Um, therefore, uh, the clarinet lacks every other overtone. And that makes it harder to get a sound that is, you know, balanced in resonance and in overtones. Uh, secondly, the clarinet overblows a twelfth uh, from its basic stack in the first few registers. And this flute and clarinet 
excuse me, the flute and saxophone over blow and octave. So the fingerings are different on the clarinet from one register to the other. So that also makes it more difficult. Um, a third reason, I think, uh, simply is that, you know, the clarinet, uh, most clarinets that we know have open holes uh, in fingerings for the basic stack. And, you know, the saxophone particularly has pearls, so it's a closed hole instrument. So you have to be much more precise on the clarinet and the fingering. And the final reason, which may be the most important of all, is that most clarinets are made of wood, whereas most saxophones and flutes are uh, metal. And as we know, wood is very susceptible to temperature and humidity changes. And, uh, you know, that results in many problems with regard to pitch and, of course, with our reeds, response of the reeds. Uh, so for all those reasons, I think the clarinet is by far the hardest instrument of certainly the, uh, the instruments that I play. But here's a little, here's a great little uh, anecdote. Uh, Frank West, who was one of the greatest saxophonists and flutists of all time and a uh, uh, member of the Basie Band, and perhaps, in my opinion, the greatest jazz flute player overall. Um, Frank didn't like the clarinet very much, especially because he was such a, a heavy flute player. So he said, he used to say, you know, the clarinet is designed by five different people in five different cities, working at five different times, none of whom know each other or communicate. That was, that's how he, he viewed the difficulty of playing the clarinet. It was, <laughs> it, you know, but, you know, the truth is to play the clarinet well, uh, you can't hide. There are certain instruments and certain instruments in, a, in certain families that you can get away with a lot. Maybe you're not going to have an embouchure or, or an understanding of embouchure that's so precise. Maybe uh, there are enough overtones to disguise the fact that the, the pitch isn't as focused as it should be or the concentration of sound isn't as focused as it should be. On the clarinet, there's no hiding. Not one area of the instrument uh, is just something you can put in your mouth and blow and it's going to sound great. You have to work at it. And I think those players who generally had a background in clarinet, who then maybe gravitate to saxophone uh, and also have a good concept of what they want the saxophone to sound like, will sound better as a result of that background on clarinet. Uh, and, you know, if we look at some of the greatest jazz saxophone players in recent times, for instance, let's take the two greatest, perhaps two greatest tenor players of the last 50 years, John Coltrane and Michael Brecker. Both of those gentlemen had clarinet first as an instrument uh, and then gravitated to alto saxophone and then ultimately tenor saxophone. But clarinet was the first woodwind that entered their mouth. And I absolutely believe that in some way helped them along the line uh, in evolving their uh, sounds and their fluency. Uh, there's also no hiding on the clarinet technique. Certain instruments are a little easier, specifically uh, flute and saxophone, in this sense. You overblow an octave. So a great deal of the primary fingerings, by adding an octave key, or in the case of the flute, perhaps lifting a top finger up, you will get the, uh, the octave without too much effort. The clarinet, no way. Uh, especially octaves, you're using a different fingering and it overblowing a 12th, it just doesn't happen automatically. I mean, you there's a lot more demand physically to play the clarinet well and to play it well over a long period of time and for many years than there is, in my opinion, for saxophone and flute. That's not to say that flute and saxophone are easy, but the clarinet is hard. It's a demanding instrument. And uh, you lay off the clarinet one or two days, you're not coming back at full strength. I mean, it's an instrument you have to be at every single day. Uh, and, of course, the reeds add that other component of difficulty. Uh, so I think people who play the clarinet first who have a desire to also play other woodwind instruments and other types of music as, in a sense, doublers have an advantage. Uh, rather than those who perhaps start on saxophone or start on flute and then pick up clarinet later on. It's rare that you see them develop on clarinet in a very good way. I, I know 
many school yeah. programs here actually start students on on clarinet, and then if they want to, they can sort of audition on saxophone the next year. And I, I think because of what you just talked about, I think that's a great thing. Yeah, that and thing. that was a tra- and that was the tradition because the clarinet was, uh, especially in the '30s and the '40s, was was the instrument. It was the guitar of that era. I mean. Betty Goodman, Audie Shore, they were the rock stars, and the clarinet was the instrument. And as a result, a lot of generations came up uh, with the clarinet as their, you know, the pop instrument of the day, not just the classical instrument of of woodwinds to play. It was the pop instrument of the day, and I think that influence lasted many generations. It's hard to uh, imagine now, though. It sure is, but... uh, (laughs) But look, there's a lot of things that that are hard to imagine that are happening now. Absolutely. <laughs> but, but, uh, but thankfully, there has been a resurgence in uh, clarinet in, in regard to uh, writing and commercial music. And certainly, uh, more and more people are establishing themselves as uh, clarinet soloists in various parts of the world. I, I noticed in one of your last podcasts, you had Martin Frost, who I think is just the end. And one of the greatest musicians we have going in the world today, irregardless if he played clarinet or not. Oh, yeah, he's uh, fantastic. He he really is. So, I mean, people like that that are surfacing. And then, you know, I find young players coming out of, you know, nowhere. You never heard of them. And they're just quite amazing. Uh, So clarinet has really uh, taken off again in another way. And I think the pedagogy and the years of... Uh, excellent teaching have now given us a whole new generation or two of virtuoso players and people who can really execute just about anything on the instrument. Um, so I hope that will continue. So you mentioned that us clarinet players have a bit of a leg up in the doubling world, having started on clarinet. What are some ways that we could apply these skills to the flute and to the saxophone, and, and where might a good starting point be? Well, okay. The natural transition, uh, if you're moving beyond clarinet, initially would I would hope would be the saxophone uh, because of the single reed nature. So uh, if you have a good concept of embouchure on the clarinet, uh, you know, a lot of that answer is directly to the saxophone. Uh, you know, we use our bottom lip to cover our bottom teeth. Uh, we're using uh, our lower jaw to move the uh, clarinet mouthpiece and reed to our top teeth. Uh, top teeth are laying on top of the mouthpiece, uh, uh, hopefully not applying too much pressure, by the way. Uh, so, I mean, that basic uh, a- aspect for setting up the embouchure is similar. Of course, the saxophone being, as we mentioned earlier, a conical bore and it's a brass instrument, there is a different aspect to that. Uh, you, In order to get the saxophone to project, you've got to get that brass vibrating. And, uh, you know, that may entail taking a little bit more uh, mouthpiece and reed in your mouth on the saxophone family than it would on the clarinet. So, uh, you know, that's one major difference. The other aspect uh, I think uh, that benefits the clarinet uh, player who's going to double is the fact that you have to be so accurate in your fingerings on the clarinet because of the open hole nature of the basic uh, you know, middle joints. Now, when you go to the saxophone where there's pearls, uh, you can you see a lot of saxophone players who maybe didn't have a clarinet background with sloppy finger positioning. In other words, they, you can play because of the fact that you have pearls that you can play not with necessarily the balls of your finger on the pearls. You can even play with your fingers flat and, uh, you know, in the middle of your finger. Yeah, you see that a lot, surprisingly. Yeah, yeah. However, if you're going to, and I, the only person I've ever seen who played saxophone like that, who, by the way, was a wonderful clarinet player and had exquisite, I mean, the greatest technique on saxophone was Phil Woods. Mm -hmm. And Phil somehow played like that, and I could never understand it until one day he explained to me that by playing that way, he could also have a cigarette in between his fingers while he was playing, <laughs> and, and and in between choruses, he could take a toke. <laughs> and that hilarious. was a big, that was a big thing in the fifties, and that's why he his technique developed like that. But uh, for most people, most humans, I mean, Phil, I consider a genius saxophonist and a genius musician, and uh, you know, it's so sad that we just lost him. Mm-hmm. But um, 
you know, for most plays, the accuracy that's required in, in fingering the clarinet when you transfer it to the saxophone is a win-win and will give you a chance at developing a cleaner, more efficient technique. Uh, the difficulty from clarinet to saxophone is that uh, you're now dealing with a larger bore instrument, larger bore mouthpiece. And so if you're going back and forth between clarinet and saxophone, sometimes we have to make those concessions in doubling where maybe we're not going to use our most quote unquote legit clarinet mouthpiece, which is generally going to be a little closer at the tip. We may have to have a little more open mouthpiece on the clarinet using a slightly lighter reed in order to accommodate the switch back and forth to saxophone. So that's, that's a, it's a, it's a, a difference and a, you know, it requires some minor alteration, but it's rare that you're going to find yourself playing clarinet and saxophone going back and forth and use your most legit type setup on clarinet and let's say a more jazz oriented setup on saxophone and be successful. You have to, there's some accommodation that's needed to be made there. Now, in going from the clarinet to the flute, now that's where we deal with the opposites. And that has to do with our lip positions uh, specifically. In the clarinet, as we said, the lips are towards the teeth. The bottom lip is over the bottom teeth, and the top lip is towards the top teeth. They're, you know, right up against it. The flute, your lips have to be away from your teeth and creating a, in a sense, another funnel and a cushion for the air to pass through. And you have to angle the air towards the back edge of the uh, mouth hole on the flute. That in itself, that one aspect of the difference in the lip position makes the transition from clarinet to flute extremely difficult. And that's where most clarinetists who then pick up flute will have the greatest problem. And it takes many years of quality flute instruction and playing so that the muscles know how to accommodate that change in an instant. Uh, it really is athletic. It's an athletic feat because the muscles in the, in the face have to be trained to work in these opposite type of directions. Now, some of the things that we can transfer from clarinet to flute or clarinet to saxophone, uh, besides what I've mentioned, has to do with the tongue position. Our tongue positions on all of those instruments can be similar, uh, hopefully uh, with the tongue wide and high in the mouth, uh, with the front of the tongue having the freedom and flexibility to articulate either against the reed or behind our top teeth uh, where the gum line meets the top teeth for the flute. Uh, also, our use of air, our breathing mechanism, is the same. And we, you know, if learning how to uh, breathe properly on any wind instrument is the first thing that really has to be addressed uh, when studying, uh, especially when you're studying in college and in the professional world. Uh, those are the same. And so it's important to note the similarities and differences between the instruments in order to become an effective doubler. But having the clarinet as your primary instrument initially with quality study, really, you know, going through the basics um, and learning how to articulate the instrument well really is hugely helpful to uh, be ultimately being a multiple woodwind uh, player. Uh, what, let me just throw one little thing in. A lot of clarinet players play double lip, which is a, is a beautiful way of playing. Uh, and certainly some of our greatest players have been double lip players. However, if you want to be an effective doubler, where flute is going to become part of that contingent of instruments, double lip playing on the clarinet and even the saxophone is negative uh, because your lip will, your top lip will not be uh, feeling full enough to create the meaningful embouchure on flute that's necessary. So that's one thing that someone who is a clarinet player considering uh, a career or e even just getting into doubling where flute is going to become a vital part of that double lip playing on the clarinet will be negative uh, for the flute playing. Interesting. Uh, and I, I know a lot of people are sort of trying to transition to that right now because many people are speaking about its benefits for the, the tonal characteristic and stuff, but it might actually hold you back in that regard. 
Indeed it will. And it's, uh, again, that's where you must have a teacher who understands what you're going through. Uh, you know, there's so many teachers that we've all encountered who have very um, uh, definitive uh, ideas about what should be and shouldn't be. And if the teacher, uh, you know, for the clarinet is not going to be understanding that you may be also studying flute and, you know, Double lip is not something that's helpful when you have to transition to flute. It can be a difficult thing. Um, it's also one of the reasons why the majority of the flute parts that are really essential traditionally have been put on single read books. In other words, an oboe doubler and a bassoon doubler sometimes have flute parts, but usually they're inner parts that are not going to be featured with solos uh, for any length of time because or good orchestrators know that those players playing oboe and bassoon uh, are not going to generally be the best flute players. Mm -hmm. It just works. It's just not feasible. They can be adequate, but not to be given the top flute parts. And so people who don't have to play the double reeds, where obviously both lips are, are very active against the reed. Uh, people who don't have to play those double reads are more likely to be given those flute parts. And so you don't want to complicate matters more by playing double lip on clarinet or saxophone than if you're going to be playing a lot of flute. So that's really interesting then. So let's say that like tomorrow morning I want to wake up and sort of <laughs> take doubling more seriously. What is the first thing I specifically should do to, to start that besides purchasing the relevant instruments, of course? Well, the first thing you want to do is decide uh, what type of psychiatrist you're going to want to see, uh, <laughs> if, because uh, believe me, you're going to see one. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, the first thing you want to do is you really must get to someone, a teacher, a flute. Uh, or a doubler who is an exquisite uh, flute player who has a depth of knowledge of the uh, physics and the ergonomics that you have to attend to in order to play the instruments most efficiently and with the least amount of uh, trouble. You really have to understand what the lips are doing on flute uh, and those differences between flute and clarinet because it will take a number of years to really get them settled. But intellectually and in your mind, you have to understand that because there will be days that you will go to the flute, and if you've played clarinet or saxophone beforehand for any length of time, where the sounds that come out, and you may have played flute two, three, four, five years, 10 years, 20 years, the sounds that'll come out would be the sounds that you got on your first day. And it can be very, debilitating and I'm telling you I've played flute now for 40 some odd years and I still encounter those days and I know I think I know what I'm doing and what I should be doing and we are all uh, subservient to the instrument in that regard the, the instruments are our masters and it's up to us to try to really uh, learn as much as we can about them to you know maybe affect uh, the type of uh, sounds and approaches we want by understanding the physics that are involved. Too many players just pick up the instrument and just blow. And that's okay if you're playing an, an instrument in a certain way and maybe you're talented and you can get by for a certain time. But when you're playing multiple woodwinds, there's no way you could just pick up an instrument and blow without a certain understanding, basic understanding of embouchure and the physics of playing the instrument. You know, it's going to catch up with you eventually. So I sort of said a second ago, rather dismissively, that, you know, besides picking up the instruments, what could we do? But, of course, the issue of actually buying the instruments becomes one of its own. I hope this isn't kind of a stupid question, but how does one get to the point where affording these instruments and purchasing these instruments um, becomes possible? Or, or how do you decide which instruments to purchase first? Or, or it just seems well, like to, at some point you're yeah. going to be owning 10 instruments here, and it's, it's a lot. It's a huge investment. Ten is a light amount. Uh, I mean, if you're, uh, I, I, no, tell I mean, that to my uh, wife. <laughs> Look, if you're a multiple wind player, minimally you have to have all the saxophones, clarinets, and flutes that are used in commercial music. That means saxophones, soprano, alto, tenor, barry, clarinets, B flat, E flat, and bass clarinet. And if you care about classical music, you're going to have an A clarinet. 
And flutes, piccolo, flute, alto flute, minimally today. Uh, they no longer write for the bass flute that much, but that was also a requirement in the 50s and 60s, into the 70s. Um, so right there, you're talking roughly 11 instruments. We're not talking about recorders, which also has now become, has come back as a necessary double. Uh, so minimally 11 instruments. And, and, you, and you mentioned about, playing piano a bit too, uh, oh, getting through well, the chord my, charts. and. Well, that, for any musician, uh, th that's no brain. That doesn't even have to be stated. If you're a musician, you play piano. So what have you got you there have too? Have you got guitar instrument. and like how many how many instruments? If you took a guess, do you think you own? Uh, well, you see, I also have a number of doubles of instruments, like you know, uh, you know, several piccolos, several different saxophones. I I think my instrument insurance chart probably has about twenty five. Wow. Uh, so, uh, and I'm, and, and that's standard to be honest with you. Now, yeah. let, let me address what you just said, cause that is a major, uh, problem today. Uh, because I grew up in the, uh, sixties and seventies, as far as when I started really getting serious about music and buying instruments, the instruments, the prices of instruments were still rather affordable. Uh, I mean, I remember my father bringing home for me, I think in 1965, a Selmer Mark VI saxophone, which is fantastic. I mean, it's an 85,000 series I still have for $400. Now, prices have come down in the last few years a little bit, but you can expect to pay, I would say on an average, somewhere around $10,000 US dollars for that instrument today. The price of inflation is nowhere near like that. If you did, if you went into the calculation chart and put in $400 in 1965, and what would it be in 2016? It's not going to show $10,000. It's going to be way below that. So the prices of instruments today, clarinets, flutes, saxophones has gone up a great deal to the point where if a young player wanted to replicate the instruments that let's say I have or the cost of them, they'd have to ransom the family jewels to buy them. I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, However, there are instruments being made, and because of the way companies have used uh, the Chinese market, Japanese market, Korean market to manufacture the instruments, you can purchase very decent instruments today for quite a bit less than, let's say, what I would consider the most, the top of the line instruments in the world. Uh, um, so, yeah, it's. It, you look, it, a clarinet, a good B flat clarinet today is going to cost you anywhere between a new thirty five hundred to four thousand dollars. A new flute today, a top line flute, is going to cost you between eight and ten thousand dollars. A piccolo is going to cost you between five and eight thousand uh, dollars. You know, with just basics on them. I mean, there's no way of getting around it unless you're willing to go down to the next level uh, of instruments. But it's still. It's a, it's a costly endeavor, and that has certainly become a crimp in the armor. Fortunately, there are things like eBay, where people can sometimes pick up wonderful instruments, older instruments. Maybe they're not in the greatest repair, but uh, for quite a bit less, and then you know put a little money into uh, overhauling them. Uh, so that's one option for people. Uh, certainly, if you're a bassoon doubler and you're looking at forty to fifty thousand dollars for a pre World War II heckle, forget about it. I mean, it's ridiculous unless you come from a wealthy family. But, you know, there are other instrument companies making instruments more uh, accessible in that regard as far as financial arrangements. Um, but, yes, it requires a lot of money. But let me also say this. Um, I, I didn't come from a wealthy family. Far from it. Uh, lower middle class family. And we had very little money for extras. Uh, my family did give this, give uh, give me private lessons, and the teacher used to come to the home, but they were very reasonable. But every bit of money that I earned uh, from college on, every bit of money went into uh, my instruments and music and my music study. And the truth of the matter is I didn't own my own car. I didn't purchase my own car until about 10 years ago when I was in my 50s. Every every car I got was secondhand. Um you know, I didn't go out on extravagant trips and waste my money on a lot of drugs or alcohol. I didn't waste my money. Uh, I really did. Everything went back into music. And that's how I was able to afford these instruments coming from a lower middle income family. And if you want to do this uh, career, even if you're not a doubler, if you're playing 
let's say you're playing clarinet and you want to be an orchestral clarinetist, you have to make that sacrifice. You can't waste time and you can't waste money. You've got to put it into the art. And uh, if you're willing to do that, so be it. And if you're not, well, accept the consequences. I think you raise a really great point about the used instruments and even going for one that's a little bit less than the one you're kind of aiming at. Um, right. I, I can actually draw a parallel to a couple years ago, I, I wanted to take up bass guitar. I'd, I found myself always learning bass lines on my guitar and I was like, I should just get a bass. But of course, you go to the store and the bass you want is like 1200 bucks or whatever. And uh, I realized very quickly that I could just go on Kijiji, which is kind of like Craigslist, but in Canada. Um, and I, I actually got three basses, a fretless, a jazz bass, and a P bass for less than the price of <laughs> um, a single bass at the store. Like we're talking probably a third the price of a single bass. I had three instruments. And right. and so and people do the same thing with clarinet, I think. Um, they, they look at the clarinet in the store that's $8,000 and they, they think, man, I'd love to have that instrument. But they don't realize that in the used market, they could get themselves a, a worthy E flat, B flat, and A for that. And, and really that's, have something to work with. Right. That's true to, to, to get off the ground with. Uh, mm -hmm. ultimate, ultimately, the competition is so great today in the industry, especially multiple wind players, that if you're going to compete at the highest levels, you really do have to have the best instruments you could possibly afford. Uh, and, and, let, and let's face it, you can have the best instruments and still not sound great if the instruments aren't in proper repair. Uh, I see too many players who are not fastidious about the upkeep of their instruments, and that uh, that can sabotage a whole career. Do, do you, you have know, to become your own best friend as far as the repairs go, or I don't know how someone could afford to maintain twenty five instruments professionally. Outside well, you of... know, well, the point is, you're not playing all twenty five instruments. I, I mean, in a typical week, if you're a working doubler, mm -hmm. uh, let you're going to be playing six to eight to 10 instruments perhaps on a week. But yes, if you have quality repair people and, and every repairman that I've gone to for any length of time has become a friend because I want to work with them and I have great respect for the uh, excellent repair technicians that I've encountered and I've been fortunate enough to be around. And uh, if you're on top of it, and by that I mean that every month you're taking care of some of your instruments and making sure they're up to snuff, you're not going to encounter bills that are going to be too extraordinary because the, when you encounter repair bills that are really high, that's when you've neglected the instruments. If you're on, if you're keeping the instruments up and really maintaining them so that, Hey, maybe a, a pad is leaking here or, you know, a pad cracked here, or you want to adjust the heights of your keys here. Those things are not going to be break the bank but they're going to keep your instrument in proper condition. So the, I, I think the main thing for any woodwind player is to maintain a, a, a quality relationship with your repair technicians and to maintain the instrument on a you know, fairly regular basis uh, every month or every other month that you're, you know, you're dealing with things if things should crop up. Uh, when I see people letting their instruments go for a year, two, three years, they haven't had their instrument worked out. Well, you know what? It sounds it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you just have to accept that. That's part of the, um, that's part of the life. It's funny, actually. I don't know if you know who this is, but I just talked to Peter Spriggs last week. Are you aware of that name? Uh, yes, I am. Uh, yeah, and I asked him when I was out there in Penticton visiting him uh, for the podcast, actually. I said, you know, what's your pet peeve that people <laughs> people don't do? And, and I said, how often should people oil their keys? And he's like, at least once, my God, like, <laughs> they come here, and they, they've been gone for a couple of years, and there's no key oil. Like, you gotta, you gotta right. just do that. It's so half the battle of this, the, the key clunking and the, the wearing of the metal is just fixed right there with a drop of oil every month. Well, we see, here's the other thing. If the recording industry was like it was in the 50s and 60s, uh, into the early 70s, where, you know, you had to go to a studio and really produce. Uh, and you couldn't have instruments that were, uh, key, like you say, key clunking at all, or else it would show up on the mic and they'll say, hey, what's that sound? You know, yeah. uh, and, you know, if you're dealing with, you know, if 20, 30, 40 piece orchestra and recording, uh, they don't want to sit and waste time with Pro Tools doing that because you haven't taken care of your instrument. That in itself 
would be the uh, mitigating force that would make you be more attentive. And, you know, we had so many woodwind repairmen. When I began my career in the 70s, I mean, we must have had it. Uh, 12 to 15 repairmen within a two or three block radius in midtown Manhattan who were there just doing woodwind repairs. Now I think there may be, my goodness, maybe one in that same area. And, and, and mo most of the repairmen are out of Manhattan because they can't afford the real, real estate uh, prices. And the work has died down that dramatically. But when there was a recording industry, that was the mitigating force. Everyone had to have, make sure their instruments were not only in good repair, but were quiet because you didn't want those sounds getting on the mic. Well, it seems like such an obvious thing for like music is a, a, a sonic art form. Like if your instrument's making extraneous noise, of course that's bad, right? I, and to be honest with you, why would you want to sound like that? Why would you want to be able to hear your instrument? I mean, uh, I mean, yes, certain contemporary works ask for certain effects and whatnot, but most of the work that we do, I mean, you don't want to hear clink and clank. I mean, that, that's not a good sound. Yeah. I mean, if you if you care about your sound, why do you want to hear that? I mean, that just doesn't make sense to me. This is a little unrelated, but it reminds me of uh, when I was in university, I, I wrote a paper on Glenn Gould, and uh, ah. he was so obsessed with achieving the perfect recording, but at the same time, he would sing through all his takes, and the way he had the piano set up, the hammers would strike at odd moments, and his chair was so rickety that... <laughs> they had to spend half their time editing out the sounds yeah. of this squeaking chair. And, and I I couldn't get my mind around how this would happen. And, and, and another interesting thing I actually encountered in my research is that one of the engineers at CBC Radio at the time, they were having a real hard time getting him to just stay quiet between takes or at the end of takes. Like he would finish a take and then he would just start talking because he was so full of full of thoughts, right? So they yeah. actually had to convince him to take artistic control of the silences, and that was the only way they could get him to, to respect <laughs> sort of the... And, and that made sense to him all of a sudden, but he still wouldn't yeah. give up his squeaky chair and, and whatever else, but... <laughs> well, the end result is that's one, of the great, that's one of the great musical minds of the 20th century, and man, are we lucky to have had those recordings and all those great recordings he made at uh, the Columbia Studios... Uh, and both Goldberg variations really stand out as quintessential statements in music history. And his humming is, it adds such character. I, I've, I've listened to other recordings and I'm, I'm just thinking in the back of my mind, where is that little, <laughs> where is that little yeah, tune? Well, <laughs> well, you know, in the jazz world, Errol Garner did that always and Keith Jarrett still does that. And you know what? Who cares? If you play like them, you can stand on your head and I wouldn't care and you could... <laughs> You know, you could throw footballs around when you're playing. It wouldn't matter. If you're playing on that level and have that type of artistic expression, man, who cares? Yeah, dude, <laughs> but dude. we're talking about, what, for the rest of us mortals, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> you know uh, we've got to quiet it down. Uh, and, and think, even if we're not in the studio, that it sh we should approach it like that, that it, the, the instrument should be in the utmost uh, should be in this greatest possible physical condition, and it allows us not to think about the instrument when we're playing. Yeah, it's super important. So, yeah. um, you must have met this in your career as well. One thing I've met as someone who also plays different instruments is the whole idea that you want to be careful not to become a jack of all trades and master of none. In your book, you've got a great story about exactly this, where Joseph Allard was studying the clarinet um, with a teacher who was, at the time, in the Boston Symphony. And right. the teacher told him he needed to quit playing the saxophone because it was screwing up his clarinet or something. So he told the, the teacher that he did, and a couple weeks later, the, the teacher praised that he sounded so much better without the saxophone, but in fact, he'd still kept playing. His teacher just didn't know. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, that, yeah, yeah, that was Gaston Hamlin, who was... Uh, uh, only in the uh, BSO, I think, for a year or two, he actually played a metal clarinet, believe it or not. In the symphony? Uh, absolutely. Wow. Yeah, that was, yeah, a lot of players did in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, Hamlin was a phenomenal musician. And there is a recording still available out there from playing the Debussy Rhapsody. I think the Clarinet Society or the Grenadilla Society put it out years ago. Uh, he was a phenomenal player and a great teacher, apparently, who influenced Joe Allen greatly. Uh, but yeah, Joe told me that story. And, uh, you know, Joe said, look, I had to earn money to pay for the lessons. So he was out playing late nights with a little group up in, uh, I guess, Massachusetts, Lowell, Massachusetts, where he was from. Um, 
and you know, just told Hamlin, yeah, he had stopped playing. And of course, Hamlin said, well, see the difference in your sound, how much better it sounds now that just, you know, but that's the type of prejudice that has existed uh, towards the saxophone and towards doubling uh, forever. And it still does at universities today. There's still these dinosaurs walking around with their doctorates, you know, who think, you know, the, the world, uh, you know, begins and ends with their uh, doctorate that they've been given from some Fakakta university. Uh, and they have no clue about the music industry, about making music in the real world, because they never did. And that's part of my peeve with, uh, unfortunately, music education, and especially higher education today, and why we're, I think, in some ways, not helping things. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, that, it's a funny story. But, you know, again, this is where if you love music, uh, you don't let the music industry or music educators who are not attuned to the real world – uh, you you don't allow them to in any way detract from your love of music. Uh, you just have to go right through them and say goodbye. Uh, and, you know, unfortunately, we all have had to do that and probably will all continue to have to do that. But, you know, that's just it's something we can laugh about. But it's 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 sometimes hard for students who are in these universities and have, you know, people who say, well, if you play clarinet, you can't play saxophone or if you're a you know, let's say you're uh, uh, you're playing in the orchestra on clarinet, you can't play in the jazz band on saxophone, uh, or you can't play in the musical theater production that's being given because then we, you know, you know that's not that's not acceptable for you. No, that's that's just idiocy. Uh, I once uh, heard someone say too that they they thought you should reach uh, the highest level you can on an instrument before moving to a new one. But from my own experience, even as as someone who also plays drums, I mean. The drumming helped the clarinet playing so much, and vice versa. I, I think that well, learning along the way really was fantastic, actually. Look, there's a reality check that you do have to accept that if you're going to play multiple instruments, you are not going to achieve the level uh, that the greatest players of that instrument or other instruments uh, have achieved. You are not, if you're playing as flute as a doubler, you're not going to play like Ron Paul or Baker or Galway. You're not going to achieve that level because there's just so much time in the day and the body can only accommodate so much and the mind as well. Uh, you're not going to reach the level of Heifetz or Casals uh, or Glenn Gould, as you mentioned, uh, in your musical uh, artistry on one instrument. However, that artistry can be spread out over many instruments and many styles of music, and it may take you a lot longer. Uh, you know, uh, you'll, you you hear young players today uh, in all types of music who are phenomenal, brilliant. And if you're going to be playing multiple woodwind instruments, well, that level of achievement may not be able to be reached till you're 40 or so. Uh, or never at all, for that matter, on any one instrument. So, you know, you do have to understand what it is. You have to love a lot of musics and love playing a lot of instruments if you're going to enter the world that I've been in. Um, and there's nothing wrong if you don't. I, you know, everybody has to find their own uh, niche and what makes them happy in music. Um, and... Uh, you know, with, if you if you can understand that intellectually and accept it, then it's easier to go forward. But uh, to to think that you can accomplish what Heifetz did or Glenn Gould did, uh, you know, Rostropovich, uh, and you're going to play many different instruments, you know, it's not going to happen. You know, you're not going to play, you're not going to read Coltrane's level if you're going to be playing saxophones, clarinets, and flutes every single day. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it just, it just not going to happen. Uh, it's a reality check. But let me, let me, as long as we're mentioning the greatest, let me give you a little story that all clarinet players should take um, maybe pride in and a little solace in. Uh, for me, the greatest jazz saxophone player ever was Charlie Parker. Um, uh, I just think Bird is in another class from any other saxophonist. And quite frankly, uh, along with Louis Armstrong, our greatest geniuses to this point in time. Now, Bird was a young man when he died. He abused himself with drugs and alcohol and you know everything. But uh, in basically the short career he had, you know, he reestablished 
uh, jazz and the language of jazz and certainly the rhythmic aspect of jazz uh, for horn players. And we are still indebted to Bird today and probably will always be. But Bird was a very studious fellow. You know, he grew up in Kansas City and didn't go to school studying as a music major in a college. He learned, you know, on the bandstand and had an inquisitive aspect to him. Now, I heard this story, uh, it was told to me by a dear friend who was my favorite jazz alto player today, Charles McPherson. Uh, and Charles told me that when he was growing up in Detroit, he went to a club when he was about 15 years old and Bird was uh, going to be featured there. And everyone was gathered around Bird to hear him talk after he finished playing and asking questions. And Charles noticed that Bird had a large saxophone case in which he also kept a clarinet. And he saw the clarinet in the case. And he asked Bird, he said, do, do you play that on gigs? And, you know, I never heard you that you played clarinet. Bird said, oh, I take it with me all, all the time to practice in the hotel. He said, it's good for you. Now, someone like Charlie Parker, who never really recorded on clarinet, would take the clarinet on the road and travel, you know, in buses, trains, planes, and take it to the hotel to practice because he understood the benefits of playing clarinet uh, and how it would help his saxophone playing. That was something that he figured out for himself as a young man. Uh, and so I think that's something that we should all take away as clarinet players, that the clarinet, even for the greatest jazz saxophone player in my book of all times, he knew that the clarinet helped him. I have to say, I'm so excited to share these stories with my clarinet or with my saxophone friends. This is going to be great. <laughs> yeah. No. It, well, look, when Charles told me that, I almost, I almost flipped, man, because I said, "Wow." That is amazing. And for, for an intellect like Bird, he realized this as a young guy and would take it. I meant traveling across country in those days wasn't like it is today. I mean, there were a lot of hours spent, and the accommodations on these planes and trains weren't like they are today, as bad as they've become on some of the planes. But I mean, it was difficult. And yet he decided he was going to take that clarinet that he never performed with in public uh, as a soloist. He was going to take it just to practice in his hotel. Now, that says something about well, Charlie Parker, obviously, but it says something about what someone who's as brilliant as Charlie Parker could understand about the clarinet and its benefit, uh, you know, across the board. That's amazing. Yeah. So yeah. we've sort of segued from the first part of your book, which is the history and the pedagogy um, is the second yeah. section. I guess they are very much related in some ways. Um, the third section, you really focus on musical excerpts for study. Um, what right. was your main goal with this section and what would you like to say about it? Well, just, just to show uh, definitively how it, in different uh, types of musical settings, whether it be jazz setting or a Broadway show, or, uh, uh, you know, record date, uh, when doubling occurs, uh, what it's like, I actually, I actually show the music, but also I talk about how one can do it most efficiently in switching, let's say, from a piccolo to a bass clarinet, uh, back to a, a soprano saxophone. I mean, those are actually some doubles that occurred in a Broadway show in the 1980s by Stephen Sondheim called Sunday in the Park with George. I mean, those extreme type of changes. And, and, well, what does one have to account for and think about and do physically to make the uh, performance as successful as you can and to make the transition uh, as painless as it can be? So this book is available on your website, you said, and the price is, yes, I it believe, is. it's $90 U.S.? Uh, it, the book is actually $75 U.S., and depending on where it goes in the world, it, uh, it, within the United States, it's 90 through PayPal. But if we go international, it's obviously more because of just the shipping and handling costs. So, so, I, that's, I, so internationally, it's done on an individual basis. Having just only a few days to have looked at this book here, I, I'm amazed by the value in here. There's, a, there's another podcast that does some book reviews I listen to, and I think they call them value bombs. You just get to something and it just explodes in your mind the, the thoughts that are that you're learning well, it's so much yeah, that yeah. every page you've got something fascinating it's just great well let me just give a quick uh, scenario i wrote this basically as 
uh, initially as my doctoral dissertation. Yes. And that and that ended, uh, let's see, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I finished the book. And, this, and then it's taken me this long to make it uh, digestible for humans. Uh, because quite frankly, dissertations are meant to be read by the dissertation committee and then filed. Uh, or some or some company, you know, prints it out and so they can fill up their catalog and say, yeah, we have, you know, we have uh, the subject matter covered. But, you know, to be honest with you, I've tried to make it hands on. And I keep revising it every year because every year I learn more or there's something else to be dealt with. Um, I, but I, it's also been helpful for me uh, as far as making sure I understand my discipline and can explain it as best as possible. So I'm trying to put something out there that uh, I know has not been dealt with. And that is how, how does one go about dealing with the art of doubling in, in a realistic, tangible manner? Um so that at least there's an understanding of what's, you know, what's in front of us. Because quite frankly, all of us who have had a career in doubling have learned it on the fly because the universities have been woefully deficient in providing that type of instruction. And um, that's something I tried to do at uh, the last um, 12, 13 years of my uh, teaching career where I st established a multiple Woodward Masters at the university that I taught at. But quite frankly... Uh, we we don't have that going in this country, and it's it's really a shame because it's one of the few areas in the industry that still provides an, uh, a livable income and a career. I mean, let's face it, there are so many orchestral positions, and there's so many positions playing musical theater, and beyond that, good luck. Yeah, no, you have to be versatile. I, I really like your your idea of the chameleon because they it's <laughs> the changing of the colors and the the wearing of different hats. Maybe you could think about it. Yeah, well, well, that 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 is it. I mean, it, uh, you know, we are chameleons. And look, even today in the orchestral world, more and more orchestras are resorting and need to play pop music type concerts or concerts with video games or concerts with movies. And this is musical stuff that they never thought of when they were at the conservatory. And it was certainly none of that on their audition. Uh, but they have to become more chameleon like to survive as well within the orchestral setting. And, you know, it, I feel like I sometimes feel as if I'm the only person on the planet who thinks this way. But I actually think it's great that, that they're enticing audiences out with that kind of music. And I think there's really nothing wrong with hearing it. I don't know. <laughs> I know that a lot of people think it's sort of lowbrow or something. but but No, there's nothing wrong with it as long as it's not being used simply for the fact that it's making up for the fact that the... Uh, subscription concerts are not attracting uh, enough audience and the donors are not giving the amount of money. I think, quite frankly, it's not being done for the artistic reason. It's being done for sheer financial reason. Now, yeah, like, that that's being, true. That, now, that being said, you've opened up another topic, which is a big thing where uh, movie music has become a real good seller for many uh, orchestras and certainly for summer festivals. And you know what? It's about time because some of the greatest music that has been written has been for movies. And, you know, we can go back to Copeland's scores for The Red Pony or how about how about uh, Lieutenant Kiji? Not a bad score, huh? Well, this that, is going to uh, sound ridiculous. <laughs> this will sound ridiculous. But when I was younger, the thing that actually got me into music was I remember I had a copy of the uh, I think it was something some John, James Bond film. And it, ah. I found it so interesting how they could use that same melody and idea in different ways throughout the movie and come back to it. And it always had this fresh life. And I spent hours just listening to this soundtrack. And, and uh, yeah, you bet. Uh, yeah. And how about and how many music historians in, in our colleges when they teach music history make use of that and teach the concept of leitmotif? Yeah. Uh, God, for, God forbid they mention a score of a TV score, a movie score. Uh, <laughs> but you know, when they're teaching Wagner, if they drew that comparison, don't you think a few more kids might be turned on? Oh, it's a great example. Yeah. I mean, of course. E even of what course. other movie? I watched another movie recently. Uh, do you know the movie Inception? I do not. Uh, the, Sorry, the soundtrack, I, I believe it was done by Hans Zimmer. And the brilliance uh -huh. of that of that movie and the soundtrack is the movie's actually about going deeper and deeper into different states of dreaming. And in the different dream states, time slows down. And so the actual soundtrack, um, when you get to the deepest dream state, there's a song that's played. And it's a little, I can't remember the name of it, but it's like a light sort of poppy tune. And Hans 
took this concept and applied it to the music. And the theme music actually is that song slowed down. I think it's like 20 or 30 times or however many times. And the low, huh. the low brass chords and stuff, if you speed them up, they actually sound like that song. It's really cool. Wow. Yeah. That's great. That, and it's called Inception? Inception. It's a great, great movie. And, and I love the soundtrack. It's just fantastic. Okay. When, when, when did that come out? I'm going to check it out. When, 2010. When, it's pretty new, actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I missed so. that. But I'll, I'll, that's, that's cool. Yeah, you I'll know, send you a look, link. It, those, some of those uh, great European composers who came over to escape the war, World War II, and found themselves in uh, the Hollywood studios and gave us some of the most glorious soundtracks imaginable. And, uh, you know, it's really, there's something to be learned again from that. So maybe that's one of the good things that's happening as a result of some of these uh, more pop concerts. But the point is that uh, symphonic musicians who have grown up with the, you know, uh, the 30 basic uh, excerpts that one has to uh, master to audition plus the Mozart concerto uh, now have to all of a sudden adapt themselves to a lot of the music that came out of Hollywood in the 40s, 50s, 60s and obviously uh, you know through the John Williams uh, uh, scores um, and it's not a bad thing uh, it, it gives you a sense of flexibility that you have to develop uh, both rhythmically and harmonically and uh, and of course Usually, when you're dealing with great composers, you're also dealing with great melodists, and and you know there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and of course, some of our greatest, like I said, some of our greatest scores in the concert world were not written specifically just for that purpose, and we've excerpted them, well, whether they were for ballets or movies, uh, or just sometimes as you know, look, what's the most popular piece being played in orchestras around the world? It's Bolero. And that was a, you know, a student project for Ravel. <laughs> yeah, not to mention like the Rite of Spring or something like that, which is often performed just as a solo orchestral piece yeah. now. Yeah, Petrushka, Firebird. I mean, look, Stravinsky, Diaghilev's collaboration gave us so much great music. But, um, you know, it, symphonies are going to have to be more flexible. And they, and they are now because our, our audiences and donor bases have diminished greatly. And uh, so this is part of our reality now. And it's part of... Uh, you know, certainly a clarinet player growing up has to look beyond uh, just the excerpt books and, and realize there's more out there to be done in order to have a long-term career. So, Ed, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. That's the end of round two. And it looks like we're actually going to have to break this into three episodes because we've got so much great stuff to talk about. Again, you can find out more about Ed and what he's been doing at joffeywoodwinds.com. You can order his book there, you can order his uh, CD there, and you can also, as we mentioned last episode, listen to the YouTube recordings that he's done with various artists, repairmen, etc. in the New York area. So thanks so much for coming on today, Ed, and we'll see you next week again. You bet, Sean. Thanks. I look forward to it. Sanding, shaping, balancing. For centuries, mastering your instrument meant mastering these crafts too. But now, D'Addario is redefining craftsmanship for the 21st century by refining their reeds and mouthpieces with technology built from the ground up. By using the world's most innovative techniques to deliver consistently what was once made variable by hand, D'Addario ensures excellence right out of the box as standard, not a surprise. So you can spend less time sanding, shaping, and balancing, and more time perfecting your own craft. To learn more about the new era of craftsmanship from D'Addario Woodwinds, visit daddario.com woodwinds.